Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely gonna be a fun one. In this video, we're gonna get into the biggest secret in vintage hi-fi, and that is Harmon and Cardin. And I know a lot of you out there are thinking right now, how is Harmon and Cardin a secret? And I think a lot of you would be really surprised at just how many people, even people my age, come into the shop and don't realize that Harmon and Cardin really made a lot of models in the 60s and 70s. Uh, a lot of people think they're a 90s brand, an AV receiver brand. And since a lot of these people didn't realize Harman Kardon was making audio products in the 60s and 70s, they're also unaware of how good these units really are. And that's what the secret is. The secret is, yes, Harman and Kardon's been around for a long time, and yes, they definitely made some of the best stereo equipment available in the 60s and 70s. And even throughout the 80s, Harmon and Cardin made some really nice equipment. I'm not as familiar with that stuff as I am the 60s and 70s, but a lot of that equipment from the 80s is well regarded. I actually really liked their turntables from the 80s. I was hoping to talk about a few in this video, and really I bit off quite a bit more than I thought I was gonna be able to. I think this is gonna be maybe a multi-part or a two-part video. Also this week, Skylabs put out a new product, our Skylights. I'll show you that video at the end of this video. So make sure to stick around until the end of the video to check out those new Skylights by Skylabs. Really appreciate it. But for now, let's get into this. Let's talk about Harmon and Cardin. And Harmon and Cardin's kind of hold a, a special place in my heart in that in 2005, I ended up buying essentially my first vintage receiver. And I had been living in apartments and hadn't had a house to myself ever. I was broke and I needed a stereo. I still had my Sirwin Vega AT15s that I bought new in like 90, 91, somewhere in there. And I needed a stereo system to finally pull those Sir Winnevegas out, get them in my living room, and see what they could do again. And after having quite a few AV receivers and just not being impressed with them at all, I decided, you know what? I don't have a TV. I don't want 5.1 surround. All I want to do is listen to music. So I'm going to grab a two-channel stereo, something that was made for listening to vinyl records and two-channel audio. So I jumped on Craigslist and I came across the listing for a Harman and Kardon 330C for 30 bucks. And at the time, I wasn't aware that Harman and Kardon had been around that long. I grabbed the receiver, I got home, I hooked it up to my Sirwin Vegas. Now keep in mind, this is an 18 watt per channel receiver. And I had been used to AV receivers claiming to be 100 watts, 200 watts, what have you. And I was, I was blown away, no question. I couldn't believe how good that thing sounded. I realized something that I didn't know was going to change my life and that the stereos that I was used to or the AV receivers that I was used to sound like shit. I mean, they really do. The AV receiver I bought with the Sirwin Vegas was a Pioneer VSX, I think it was a 9700 or a 9400. And I've actually picked up a few of those over the years and plugged them in for nostalgia purposes. And they sound exactly the way I remembered them. And it's okay. It sounds okay, but it is not nearly anything as good as that little Harmony Carden 330C. And that was my revelation moment. And this experience kind of led me down the rabbit hole of where I am now. I went from having my Sirwin Vegas and a Harman Kardon 330C to now looking on Craigslist all the time and picking up any vintage receiver I could find just because I wanted to try them out. And my living room looked like some of yours out there. I know a lot of people that go through this phase where when they stumble onto vintage electronics, it kind of becomes an addiction. You're almost kind of just grabbing everything you can get your hands on at a cheap price. And in 2005, the prices were insanely cheap. You know, I didn't pay more than 80 or hundred dollars for anything. So I was able to try a lot of the stereo equipment. And that really is what led me to opening Skylabs in a roundabout way. It really was that Harman Kardon 330C 
that kind of showed me the light in what two channel stereo can sound like for a really reasonable price. And it's still reasonable today. Once that revelation happened, there was no turning back. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop reading. I couldn't stop looking. I couldn't stop buying this equipment. My house looked like our showroom at several points in life. Eventually my wife and my girlfriend at the time, you know, it was getting a little bit out of control. Although she was more than understanding of my hobby, she knew how passionate I was about it. I couldn't help it. There was nothing I could do. It just kind of took over everything. Really, that's my introduction to Harmon and Carden. They really are an amazing little receiver for something that's rated at 18 watts. And I know the AT15s are 102 or 103 dB efficient, but I think you'd be surprised at how many speakers that little 18 watt per channel receiver will drive really well to where you won't ask for more watts. It'll give you everything you need. Enough about the 330. Um, that's just my introduction to Harmon and Carden. And something I didn't realize, I never really put it into thought until I was making this video. Another reason why we're gonna have to make this a couple parters, because I wanted to share that story with you guys. I think everybody has a story of that first piece that really struck them, you know? And if, if you haven't, maybe keep looking, because there are pieces out there that will do that for you. It becomes almost an obsession, but it's a good obsession. It's music. It's good for the soul. Good investment, always. And while my plan was to start with some tube equipment, we'll have to save that for the second part. Uh, the Citation 2 needs to be mentioned. The amplifiers like the 12 and the 16 need to get talked about. The Model 11 preamplifier, those are all things that I wanted to talk about in this video, and we just don't have time. I ended up stumbling on some really good guides by a moderator and a staff member of Audio Karma, and his handle is D Lucy. And this guy's really done a great job of kind of presenting the history in these different models and the variations. And I realized there were some things that, you know, I didn't want to glance over when talking about these. So if D Lucy's out there watching, I'll do my best to do your information justice. And D Lucy kind of broke down the solid state 70s receivers in four categories. And we're really only going to talk about three. And that would be starting off with what he calls the Nocturne era. And the receivers in the Nocturne era are ones that I am not super familiar with. We've only had a couple of these and they were the spelled out 330s. I haven't seen the other ones in person. These are the early 70s and late 60s Harmon and Carden solid state receivers. And like Pioneer and Sansui and everybody else, you know, this was kind of new technology and I kind of got a feeling they were plagued with problems. Technology really advanced quite a bit, you know, just in five, six years. It's no different than, you know, LED TVs and everything else. Engineers figure out ways to make things perform better, use less parts, less complicated, more reliable, and solid state electronics was the same thing. The early solid state receivers, whether it was Pioneer, Morant, Sansui, Harmony Carden, doesn't matter. Um, they were a little bit on the complicated side. There was a lot of extra things that they were able to simplify in versions down the road. So the late 60s, early 70s models, you just don't see them as often. Um, these are really cool looking receivers. The couple 330s that we did have, I thought sounded great. They didn't necessarily grab me. I don't think there are a lot of them out there. I don't think there's a lot of parts out there for them either. So just keep that in mind if you are gonna pursue a Nocturne era Harmon and Carden. I'm not saying they're bad. I just like stereo equipment that's reliable and has readily available parts. So that kind of takes me out of this era of Harmon and Carden. And the next era, according to DeLucy, would be the minimalist era. And included in this era would be the, the 230, the 330, the 330A, B, and C. And really this ranges from 1970 up to 
1978. And the 230 is kind of the outlier here, uh, coming in at 15 watts, where the, the 330 models from the 330 all the way through the 330C, um, they're right around the 18 to 20 watt per channel range. And I've never seen a 230. We've had quite a bit of 330s, uh, especially the B's and C's. And there's quite a bit of debate online, just like everything else, as to which one is the best. And a lot of people like the B's the best. And one of the reasons being that the B is a capacitor coupled amplifier, as opposed to the C, which is a direct coupled amplifier. And a lot of people think the cap coupled amps sound more tube-like, but really that's just personal opinion and personal taste. The other thing that the B has over the C is it does have pre-out and main ends. And this is something you usually do not see on a receiver with this few of watts. Usually they keep the pre-out main ends for the, the receivers further up in the line with more power, more features, that type of thing. But Harman and Carden did include it in this era of their entry-level receivers. With the C, it doesn't have the pre-out main ends. And you might say, well, what's so special about the pre-out main ends? Well, there's a lot of things. You know, you could either use this to go into a separate amplifier. You could go out of the pre-out into an amplifier and just use the preamp and tone controls of your 330B. Or if you wanted to run a subwoofer, this would be a good way to run a subwoofer. So having that pre-out main in just kind of opens up the possibilities for other things you can do with your stereo if you need more power or if you want to add a subwoofer or an EQ or there's actually several reasons you might want to have those pre-out main ends. Just more options. And the next group or the next era of receivers in DeLucy's guide would be the Twin Power series. And in this line, you have four receivers, and that would be the 430, the 630, the 730, and the 930. And this is where Harmon and Carden, in my opinion, really gets kind of special in the world of 70s stereo receivers. In that a dual mono or twin power amplifier is quite a bit more expensive. And really because a power supply is a huge cost to an amplifier and having two of them doubles your cost. So while other manufacturers really only put dual mono power supplies in their high end integrated amplifiers or power amplifiers, Harman and Carden decided to do this with even an entry level receiver like a 430, which is the baby of this line. And then it goes all the way up to the 930. And this line was manufactured between 1973 and 1978. From the baby, the 430, all the way through the 930, all of these units are dual power supply, and that is very unique. I honestly don't know of any other receivers in the 70s from Pioneer or Sansui, um, the major brands that did a dual power supply receiver, let alone a 20 watt per channel receiver. It's almost kind of unheard of, but I think Harmon and Carden was really going for that. We're going to give you the best quality and we might scale back or cut back on some of the cosmetic features. You know, there are things that they did in order to keep the price down and still put two power supplies in these receivers. And I think a lot of you might wonder why do you want two power supplies? And I'll do my best to explain this in a real almost layman's terms because I think we'd have to go ask a true stereo engineer why this is better. But from what I gather, the idea behind this is when you have two power supplies, you essentially have two mono amplifiers in one housing. And the benefit to that would be there's less chance of crosstalk or interference from the left and the right stereo information to bleed over to each other, which should give you a wider sound stage. If none of the information coming out of that left amplifier is getting into the right channel speaker and vice versa, essentially you've got better separation. That's the way I've always interpreted it. There might be noise or interference reasons why this is better, 
but I think the main selling point was what I just explained, and that is for better stereo isolation and separation. So whether you are or not on board with that might be a reason why you might want to check out a Harman and Kardon twin powered receiver to see if you get a better sound stage. As I do think a lot of people really value what kind of sound stage a receiver is delivering. Otherwise, in other brands, there are lots of integrated amplifiers and amplifiers that are either dual power supply or mono blocks even, where it's two different power supplies in two different chassis, which in theory should be even better than two power supplies in the same chassis. And personally, I think if you have a chance to pick up any one of these, I would definitely look at the 730 Twin. I think it's the favorite out of this lineup for me and several others. I think it's kind of the sweet spot. And the 730 Twin was manufactured between 1976 and 1978. You got 45 watts per channel and you have a lot of inputs. Uh, you've got two phonos, you have four line level so two auxes and two tapes and then you also have your pre-out main ends and then your two sets of speakers so for a 40 watt per channel receiver i think it's going to be tough to find another receiver that has this many ins and outs which is definitely unique the other thing with Harmon and Cardin that we definitely need to talk about with this era is their excellent design and that these are really easy for a technician to navigate and service everything is laid out really well you don't have to move boards aside to get to other boards and it just makes working on these a lot more palatable than maybe some of the other units where there were a lot of boards crammed into a small space harmony Carden really simplified everything and laid things out really nicely in order to be able to be serviced and maybe that's some of the reason why there are still quite a few of these out there. They're not as rare as a lot of people would think, considering a lot of people don't realize Harmony Carden made receivers back in this era. So I think a lot of that has to come down to the fact that they were built so well, they stayed working a long time, and technicians like working on them because they're kind of easy to work on. So you put those things together and you have a lot of units available for sale today. And you do with Harman and Kardon. These are still really undervalued in my opinion. I think if you take any one of these receivers watt to watt and you compare it with a, a Pioneer, Sansui, Yamaha, or Marantz from this era, I think you're still getting a bargain. And that's why this video is named what it is, which is the biggest secret in 70s vintage audio. I still think that's true, although a lot of people are getting savvy to it. Um, the prices have started coming up. And, you know, while a lot of people in the comments will say, you know, why don't you ever talk about Harmon and Carden? Which really isn't true because I think they're on every, you know, best receiver under this price point video we've made. On the flip side, you'll hear the same amount of people going, you know, don't talk about Harmon and Carden. Um, this is our secret. We want to keep it. We want to keep the prices low and I still want to accumulate more of these. So it's one of those catch 22 things. The word is getting out. If you're looking for a vintage stereo receiver from the seventies, I definitely cannot recommend Harman and Kardon enough. Anything from the B and C series, especially in my opinion, I think they're the best built and the most reliable pieces of the line. Oh, and I probably should mention before everybody says, why didn't you talk about the sound? Um, a lot of people think that the 730 Twins or the Twin Amplifiers, this series of Harman Kardon, everybody likes to say, well, it's real tube-like, and I don't agree with that at all. Um, I think these are really punchy, uh, almost neutral sounding. I don't think there are any big peaks or dips in the frequency response of these. I think they it's a real natural sounding amplifier and that's what i like about it i like things to be even a little bit on the clinical side i like things to be neutral at least for my amplifier i'll let my speakers color the sound if i need some color um if i want more color i'll get i'll get my tube amplifier out but for solid state 
I like neutral. It's almost a blank canvas. And, um, you know, not everybody likes that. I get it. But I don't think these are really tube sounding. I think they do a good representation of putting out what you put in. And that's what I like. So plenty of bass. Um, Mid-range is great. The treble is not harsh. And with a little bit of shaping from the tone controls or even the contour button, which is the same as the loudness button, um, I think you can get almost any colorization you're looking for. If not, maybe grab an EQ. I don't know. It's good clean power from a really good manufacturer, very repairable and underpriced in my opinion. That's win, 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 win. Definitely gonna try and get back to the Harmon and Cardin series again. Um, the, the amplifiers from this era are really important. There's a lot of them out there again because they are so good and so repairable. So we definitely need to talk about those, but we'll save that for another video. Thank you for sticking around. Definitely check out this one minute little video showing our new Skylab skylights. And really, this is an LED kit that you can put on your Fluence U-Turn, uh, the Marantz TT15 turntable it fits on. Make sure you look at the measurements on the website before you purchase one for your turntable to make sure it will fit. But for those of you that have an acrylic platter and would like to add a little bit of lights to your ambiance, um, I think these kits do a great job. Thank you so much for watching another video. Really appreciate it. Hope everybody's having a great fall, great Sunday. I'll shut up now. Here's the video. Thank you.